one of the things that makes um, innovation a crapshoot is that they took first year marketing at the Harvard Business School or comparable places and they were learned principles of marketing and segmentation that turn out to be wrong. So as a result though of the work that we teach, most companies will segment the market by product category or customer category. So the way the automobile behaves as if their market is structured is by product category. You've got subcompacts, compacts, midsize, full-size SUVs, minivans, sport cars, luxury cars, and so on. And when they, the reason why that framing of the structure of the market is critical is whenever they develop a new product, they slot it, slot it into one of these categories and they believe that they win if they just have more features than everybody else. There are a lot of others that f behave as if their market is structured by customer category. So you have 45 to 55 year old women with and without college degrees. Or you've got low income, middle income, high income households or small, medium, large businesses or industry verticals. And a lot of people believe that their market is structured that way. And so when they develop a, park, a, a, a new market, they have to slot it into a customer where, and, and they try to make a product that a, a, um, a tree is, um, attracts the average customer in that segment. And if you're in the company looking out on the market, indeed that's the way the world appears. The problem is if you're the customer, that's not the world feels like at all. If you're the customer, you know, stuff just happens to you every day. Jobs arise in our life that they got to get done and they hire products or services to get these jobs done. And it turns out that understanding the job, not understanding the customer, is what's critical in making uh, innovation much more predictable. So once we understood what job the customer was trying to do, it be became very clear how to improve the job so that it could do it better against the real competition. Importantly, the size of the market typically is unrelated or only partially co correlated with the size of a product. And therefore, in innovation, we can just get very um, de dece deceived by thinking a big a, a, a product that the market is small or large because you don't know unless you crawl in the customer's perspective and figure out who, to, who we really compete against. A long time ago, Peter Drucker said this better than I could when he said that the customer rarely buys what the customer thinks it's selling him. How could we more, more predictably develop a new product uh, opportunities that have a low probability of failure. And the way I'd like to describe it is at the beginning <coughs> is this fundamental question, what's the basic job the customer's trying to get done? What's the result that the customer needs to accomplish? And in every job has a functional, emotional, and a social dimension to the job. Then what experiences do we need to provide in purchase and use so that those experiences will sum up to nailing the job perfectly, then how do we need to integrate and what do we need to integrate so that we provide the experiences required to get the job done perfectly? And on top of that, we then give it a brand that pops in customers' mind when they realize that they have this job to be done a purpose that leads them to the product that you've organized. So um, how does it relate to some things in the medical world? Um, you know, there, there has been a lot of money spe uh, spent on medical records. Uh, and the, the uh, Washington, the, the White House folks have a sense that we just need to make it cheaper 
for primary care doctors to, in, to, to use uh, electronic medical systems, even while the guys, uh, the, the primary care doctors, continue to keep it on little cards in their pocket. And uh, my guess is that um, if we made it free and we actually put it all in and installed it for them, they still would not be, uh, be used. It, the data would just fit on a disk drive instead of in, in cabinets. Um, and the only reason why, or the only mechanism by which you would put it into use is that doctors will pull them when people develop applications that are developed that help doctors get the jobs done that they're trying to get done in their lives. Uh, let me just talk a, a little bit about um, the business model. We have a case in my course about a, a company in Michigan called Manufact um, shoot, Michigan Manufacturing Corporation, sorry. And they have nine plants and they make axles for cars and trucks. One of the plants in, Mich in Pontiac, Michigan, uh, the corporate folks decided to shut it down because it was by far the most uh, high cost of all of the nine plants in their system. And uh, the, uh, the CEO, or the plant manager, was my cousin, so I, I knew it quite well. And he knew, or she knew that um, his, her costs were high, but when he went into, into the plant, she couldn't see costs anywhere. They really thought they were squeezed down, and yet the data showed that. And when you walked in their factory, this is what it looked like. So um, it was organized with the type of machines all t in the same place. And the reason for organizing the plant in this way was threefold. The first is the equipment was very expensive, so that you utilized it more effectively. Second, the workers were very expensive. And so they could have expertise in each type of equipment and utilize them most effectively. But the most important dimension is that this, man, this plant had a, a, a um, value proposition to their customers, which is, you guys, whatever product you need to have be, be made, we can do it for you bring your, your design here and we can make anything for any customer. And because of this facility, uh, they could just route it through any sequence of these uh, operations to make anything for anybody. And so one might through here and, through, and run, run through this sequence of operations, but another product that is just a different design would start in a very different place. And at the end, they would all put out off that way. And, and that was just the way they were organized because of the value proposition, we will do anything for anybody. So he was interested that the, at the other end of the spectrum in, in Michigan manufacturing was a plant in Maysville, Ohio. In Pontiac, for every dollar of direct cost that is spent in making the product, they had 6.2% do dollars of overhead cost. Just managing all of this complexity of various, pr every product taking a different path through the, the plant. And in Maysville, Ohio, it was only $2.2 dollars of o overhead cost for a direct dollar of, uh, of dollar direct cost. So we go, went down and uh, found that there was a very different process. And what he realized is that about 15 years ago, what the co corporation had done is they took the, f the two highest pathways that products were taking through the, the Pontiac plant and took that sequence of operations, almost like a, s a snake, out of, of Michigan and, and put them down in Maysville, Ohio, and straight it out in a straight line. And then the second highest volume route 
they took that down and straight it out as a, um, in, in Maysville, Ohio. And, they, and that plant made a very different value proposition. And that was in this plant, we don't do anything for anybody. But if you have a design that can be made by following through this sequence of processes, we will do it at very high quality and very low cost. And so um, Noel Allen went back realizing, gosh, we have two fundamentally different value propositions. And, and so we then tried to figure out where all of the rest of, of the plants uh, were on this spectrum. And what we found is that in Pontiac, there were, although they could make anything for anybody in practice, there were uh, products making t one of 24 different pathways through that factory. In, in Maysville, Ohio, there were just two pathways through the factory. Um, and, that, and whenever you doubled the number of pathways that products were taking mm -hmm. through the factory, it reduced, it, it increased overheads by 30% for every doubling when you went from one to two, two to four, four to eight. And that's why this one was so expensive is because they had 24 different pathways. Um, anyway, um, I wanted to ask you a question. If I took away the names of the equipment from there and I asked you, is this diagram an axle factory or a hospital, what would you say? You can't tell. It's exactly the same concept for exactly the same reason, isn't it? And that is a typical hospital. Their value proposition is, hey, you guys, I actually don't care what's going Bring it here. We will solve any problem for anybody. And, uh, and so they have to organize it in this way. Now, I'll get into that a little bit later, but it turns out that it's even worse than that because to be able to do anything for anybody, we have in our hospitals three fundamentally different and incompatible business models at work. And these are the only types of business models in the world. There are three types. One of them we call value solution shops. And a solution shop is a business whose job is to de define the problems and recommend solutions. Um, it turns out that the activities and the intuitive acti activities in hospitals that are trying to figure out what's, what's wrong with you is a solution type activity. The second type of business model we call a value adding process business where basically you bring stuff in that is not complete or is broken and you fix it or add value to it and ship it out the other side. And so most manufacturing is a value-adding process business, but most education is also. So at the Harvard Business School, every fall, we bring in 900 very incomplete people, and step by step, we perfect them and send them to Wall Street two years later. <laughs> Procedures that are done after uh, a, 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 a clear diagnosis have been made act a lot like value-adding process businesses. So the third type is a facilitated network, or telecommunications is a business like that. I give you data, you give me data. In, uh, insurance, I put our premiums, premiums into the pool. You take our claims out of the pool. Generally, a solution shop business makes its money in a fee-for-service basis. Value-adding process businesses get their fees on a fee-for-outcome basis, and these guys make their fee on a, a fee-for-membership basis. And in a typical hospital, we have all three types of business. A typical hospital has 110 different pathways that patients might apply through the hospital. And as a result, for every dollar that is spent actually caring for the patient, there are $8.5 of overhead cost that are just exist because of the complexity of people walking through. And when a hospital has separated out value-adding process activities, those overhead costs just fall away. 
So um, that's kind of the next thing that we think has to be done is it's not just um, going through to simplify the problem from the, the, that enable different caregivers to provide better care, but they then have to be um, embedded in new business, oper uh, business models that can separate them out to each one to do what the job that needs to be done. Thank <laughs> you.